joining us. Uh, thank you to our speakers, Salah Muslim, Miro Chichek, Raimar Haider, Thomas Jeffrey Miley, and our moderator, Dimitri Musopoulos. Thanks are also due to our partners, uh, PM Press and the Peace in Kurdistan campaign. You can find links to their websites and projects in the description. Uh, you can share this video now or later. It will remain permanently at this link. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. There's a subscribe button right below this video. Um, also subscribe to our newsletter and follow us on social media. All of the links are in the description. Uh, you'll also find links to the projects that our partners are working on. They're fascinating. Um, they involve things that are very relevant to this conversation. If you'd like to donate to Black Rose Books or pick up free um, and discounted eBooks, you can check out our eBook shop, payhip.com slash Black Rose Books. And if you want any physical books from Black Rose, you can go to www.blackrosebooks.com. With that, I'll go ahead and introduce our speakers. First, born in Kobani, Syria, Salah Muslim became involved in the Kurdish freedom movement while studying chemical engineering at Istanbul Technical University. He was a founding member of the Democratic Union Party. In 2003, he became a member of the PYD Executive Council and was elected co-chairman of the party in 2010. He held the position until 2017. He is now a member of the co-presidency council of the party and lives in Kamishli, Syria. Miro Chichek was born in a Kurdish guest worker family in Germany. She became engaged in politics and women's activism at the age of 16 with the Kurdish Women's Peace Office in Dusseldorf. While studying political science, sociology, and history at Goethe University in Frankfurt, she began work as a reporter and editor for the only daily Kurdish newspaper in Europe. Thomas Jeffrey Miley is a lecturer of political sociology at the University of Cambridge and a member of the board of the EU Turkey Civic Commission and a patron of Peace in Kurdistan. He is co editor with Federico Venturini of Your Freedom and Mine, Abdullah Uchalan, and The Kurdish Question in Erdogan's Turkey, published by Black Rose Books in 2018. Raimar Haider is a physician by training and a human rights activist. He is one of the spokespersons of the international initiative Freedom for Abdullah Ojalan, Peace in Kurdistan, and has translated several books uh, by him into German. I'll now hand it over to our moderator, Dimitri Rusopoulos, who is a longtime activist, organizer, and publisher with Black Rose Books. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoy our event today. That was the thing. Uh, a warm welcome to all of you uh, who are watching us throughout the world, and most especially to our wonderful panelists, all four of them. Um, what I would like to say is very briefly that uh, it is important to note the existence of this book, My Freedom and Yours, which was co-edited by uh, Thomas Jeffrey Miley. It is a fundamental text uh, to introduce the reader to a, the broad scope of the Kurdish question and the significance of uh, Abdul Ocalan. And it's available as part of this panel. It's highly recommended. Uh, it is a book that reflects in many important ways to uh, international peace and human rights missions that I was part of, uh, where we went to Istanbul in 2016 and 2017 again to Istanbul and to uh, uh, Diyarbakar. And the purpose of the mission in both cases was to uh, promote the idea that a discussion had to start all over again between the Kurdish community within Turkey and uh, the Turkish government. And that part of this discussion absolutely required the presence of Abdul Ocalan. And the second part of our purpose was to uh, 
have the opportunity to meet Abdul Ocalan in the dreadful prison that he's in, in Imrali, in the middle of the Bosporus, to um, see how he was, to uh, have a sense of his conditions of health, and to establish a link with this very important person. Uh, the delegation was led, and the book is dedicated to uh, a very interesting person who came all the way from South Africa to head our delegation, uh, Judge Essa Musa, who unfortunately died in 2017. He was uh, a very important uh, figure in our delegation and happened to be also a lawyer for uh, Nelson Mandela. So that is sort of the context uh, out of which we the prism through which we see the Kurdish question. And at the core of these two attempts uh, to see and to talk to people, and we met all sorts of organizations and all sorts of uh, people within Turkey, was to assess also the civil rights or the civil liberties or the civil abuses actually of the Turkish state against the Kurdish people within Turkey and um, a very uh, lucid, very well-documented report was uh, the result of um, these uh, two delegations, which are in the heart of this book and very well worth not only reading, but studying. So that is sort of the context of why we continue to pursue our interest in uh, the Kurdish question, not only because of what is happening and not happening within Turkey, but also what is happening to the Kurdish people outside of Turkey, most particularly in <clears throat> Rojava, right across the border in northeastern Syria. So I would like now to invite Miral to um, explain to us what the significance is of August uh, the 15th. What is its important? Uh, to us, to all of us, and what is it? What is important about it uh, to the Turkish people? Thank you, uh, Dimitri. Um, 15 August 1984, armed resistance against imperialism colonialism and occupation in four parts of Kurdistan. This date is referred to as the day of revival within the Kurdish people, because at that time, uh, the Kurdish people was pursued dead, especially in the Northern means the Turkish part of Kurdistan, where it was almost impossible even to talk about the existence of the Kurds at that time. Kurdish uprisings for local autonomy and national rights had been brutally crushed by the state powers, especially the Turkey state had aimed to eliminate everything about the Kurdish identity and uprise. That's the reason why the state had not only destroyed the self-rule of the region Dersim in 19. 37-38, which is considered the last big Kurdish resistance because before the founding of the PKK within the borders of modern Turkey, but committed physical and cultural genocide. After four decades of silence, a group of idealist students and workers dared to revive the Kurdish identity by founding the Kurdistan Workers' Party, the PKK. When the PKK launched its guerrilla war on the Turkish army, they had no big forces or states sponsoring them. They were able to create the ground for the guerrilla war through solidarity based on internationalism, the approach to create a national front with other Kurdish forces while opposing nationalism, and an unshakable belief in self-strength. In this sense, it marks the first Kurdish uprising that did not rely on state forces, which might instrumentalize them for their own interests or betray them. 
It marks the cut with the idea that Kurds are not even able to raise their voices without the support of state powers. The first bullet was fired against all manners of enslavement. It changed the reality of the Kurdish people from a passive, silenced, diffident existence to a nation fighting for its freedom and a life and dignity. The first bullet was fired against collaborationism and betrayal, which had been seen as the main reason for failure of all the Kurdish uprisings in modern era. In this context, the first bullet did not only target the Turkish military, and in this sense, the external enemy, but also the internal enemy. Most of the Kurdish uprisings in the 19th and 20th century were not able to overcome local borders and localism. In addition, a lot of them had a tribal character. But the August 15 marks the announcement of the first national liberation movement in Kurdistan, which in addition openly challenged feudalism. Not only men, but also women actively participated in the preparation process of guerrilla warfare, even though the number of women was limited in the first years, they played an important role in the development of the political, ideological and armed struggle. Moreover, for the first time, Kurdish women commanded male fighters. The first female commander was Hanan Yaverkaya, uh, nom de guerre. Uh, Berivan, who was responsible for a unit of male fighters in Eru, uh, where the first military action on August 15 uh, took place. Uh, August 15 marks the cut with traditional gender roles in Kurdistan. Uh, the fact that male and female guerrilla fighters live and struggle shoulder to shoulder based on comradeship in the mountains of Kurdistan had a very deep impact, especially on women in society. The change in the relationship between women and men in the guerrilla ranks, the very radical gender struggle, the redefinition of freedom and equality based on overcoming the mindset of masters and slaves had its reflections on the whole movement and the society. After August 15, more and more women joined the guerrilla. In the first half of the 90s, the Women's Army was formed. Today, the Women's Movement organizes itself autonomously and has equal representation and participation in all mixed structures. The Women's Movement constitutes the main motor force and revolutionary dynamic within the struggle for freedom and the building of a social and political system that is based on democracy, ecology, and women's liberation. I think another main significant 15 is that it showed us the essentialness and legitimacy of self-defense, that no individual, community, or people should consider her or himself helpless or powerless faced with fascist dictatorship, state violence, and genocidal attacks. In this sense, especially today, the Kurdish freedom movement is challenging the notion of the monopoly of violence owned by the state, which is actually the denial of people's rights, uh, people's right uh, to resist. What started 36 years ago with a small force with light arms, today turned into a huge self-defense force, which was able to stop even ISIS. And if we look at the dialectics of armed resistance and political struggle, not just in Kurdistan, but in the whole Middle East, we see that the armed struggle has created and still is creating the ground for political change and opportunities. In this sense, armed resistance and political struggle complete each other. What shapes both is the apoist ideology. And this is very essential because it prevents the armed resistance from becoming deconstructive for the movement. What might happen when strategy and tactics no more comply with the conditions and the objectives. One of the strengths well, of yeah. Kurdish, yes? Uh, you have a few minutes left. No, I'm, I'm just coming to, uh, to the end. Good, thank you. Okay. So one of the strengths of the Kurdish freedom movement is its ability to constantly self-reflect and renew itself 
its organizational form and its tactics. Handling difficulties and obstacles as resources of progress as a main dialectic of revolutionary practice made it possible for the Kurdish freedom movement to keep growing, not only since 15th August 1984, but since the very beginning until today. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for a very uh, articulate statement. Um, and now I would like to invite our other panelists, our other friend to get into the situation and to try to deal with some of the questions that we had already suggested that he deal with. Please welcome our next friend. Well, thank you very much for everybody. Uh, uh, first of all, I salute all the people which they are still struggling in the uh, Kurdistan and their friends everywhere. And my greetings to the uh, people and uh, thanks to all the uh, people who helped to arrange for this, uh, organize this event to make us able to talk to the people. Well, uh, talking about the uh, 15th of August, 1984, it was uh, just uh, a result of the creating the free people in the mentality and in the mind and in the will. Uh, those people were created uh, since 1970s uh, by Mr. Rogerland. And then a result of that was 15th of August, which they, they couldn't stand. I mean, they were in the prison uh, for in Ahmed Diyarbakir and they were they, they were able to burn themselves and to go to the hunger strikes and uh, and the result was uh, the people should have uh, done something for that and the result was 15th of August 1984 which they start to uh, to defend their dignity and the people I mean their their honor to support their friends and so the free man and he, if he is free in the mind and mentality and uh, free will, I think he could do uh, everything. So it was creating this man who is free in his mentality and in his will. Uh, I think uh, it's, a, it's a revolution for the Kurdistan. Uh, I mean, the real revolution because the free man can do everything. I mean, free man and woman, uh, they can do everything. And what we are living now in Kurdistan, over all the Kurdistan, four parts of Kurdistan, and even in diaspora, is a result for creating this uh, free people in their will and their man. So uh, those, uh, I mean, well, I, I'm not going to talk about the details in four parts of Kurdistan, but uh, in, in uh, north and east of Syria, uh, of course, there was uh, a lot of efforts for the people here to create those, uh, um, uh, such a uh, people, I mean, free in their will and their uh, their mentality. Uh, as you know, Mr. Ojalan was in, in in Lebanon and Syria for 20 years. So a lot of people, they were just students over there. They were taught and they were educated and so on. And uh, of course, the freedom also is uh, uh, contagious uh, to the people. I mean, they can uh, be affected by each other. So it's now spread over all in the Kurdistan. And uh, especially in Rojava, uh, we as the people, I mean, we started to organize ourselves according to that. Uh, you know, there was a dictatorship and depressed uh, regime in Syria and uh, all the depressing and all the Kurdish people, I mean, uh, at least, I mean, since the 2004, we were struggling against this regime, organizing for ourselves. And the Syrian revolution was an opportunity for us to go ahead. And we were enforced to, I mean, liberate our areas because we didn't want this, uh, uh, I mean, the fighting between the Salafis and religious people, jihadists and the regime to come to our lands. And then we were enforced to enforce uh, I mean to establish our uh, democratic self-administration in 2013 and we are struggling till now 
against, I mean, at the beginning was against the regime and then was against those uh, brutal jihadists like Daesh and uh, the other organizations. And recently when we defeated them, we are struggling against Turkey and the others too. And now Turkey is occupying the part of the north of Kurdistan, I mean, uh, Rojava and the north of Syria, like Afrin, Serikani and so on. So our struggle is still continuing. And I think uh, most people, I mean, with our friends, supporters, uh, everywhere and everybody in the world uh, should, uh, the, I mean, they were able to see what's going, what's the reality, in, I mean, in the Kurdistan and all the far, four parts. But the mo most important things, I mean, this uh, uh, Turkey, we are not talking about the Turkey, we are talking about the NATO because Turkey is, uh, uh, was able to take the NATO behind it. And now the fightings and everything, I mean, as you know, uh, it's uh, done by the uh, NATO sophisticated weapons and so on. Otherwise, they, they would be able to occupy Afrin. They wouldn't be able to occupy uh, Tel Aviv and Rasul Ain. But till now, still, I mean, even in Europe, if they are considering P P uh, PKK and the other organizations trying to put in the terrorist list is just because they're forced from the NATO. I think uh, we should be aware of that and we should defend ourselves uh, because we don't want to lose uh, this opportunity. We know our friends also are struggling with us, uh, but we have to change a lot of things I mean to do because actually uh, in the face to face, we are fighting against Turkey and Turkish occupation and their tools just like Daesh the other jihadists, but the actual thing behind them, it's NATO itself. Otherwise, why PKK and they are trying even for us in northeast of Syria, we have defeated those jihadists, we have defeated Daesh, and still they are not helping us, not standing by us. So it's a, it's a very uh, strange situation now. And uh, of course, we will defend ourselves. But what uh, what is important, I mean, the people, I mean, in overall Kurdistan and in, even in diaspora, uh, those Kurdish people, they, were, they are a result of this, uh, the people, creating the people, the free people in their mind and their mind, uh, well. So when you create such a things, uh, you can do everything. So by the main, everything is happening in Kurdistan now is the result of 15th of uh, uh, August, I mean, 1984. All the developments happened, all the progress happening in the Kurdistan areas, fighting against uh, uh, Daesh, fighting against the jihadists, fighting against the Turkish uh, occupation. And so it's, it's a big struggle. We think now because, I mean, this uh, uh, freedom, I mean, for the mentality on the personality and the people, it's now uh, is transmitted to the Arabs also. And now Arabs, we are living together, I mean, in northeast of Syria. Maybe you have heard just a few days ago, uh, there were some, uh, I mean, events. So we were uh, talking to the Arab tribes and so they are looking for this administration and looking, I mean, they are tied to Ojalan's ideas and Ojalan's mentality. They are looking for the brotherness living together. So actually, I mean, everybody was looking for the democracy, looking for the brotherness, for the solution in Syria, for the living, the people living together. I mean, they should support this administration north of, uh, northeast of Syria. Uh, now, of uh, now let me interrupt you. Let me interrupt you, please, uh, dear friend, to say that you have about three minutes left. And okay. I would ask you to do two things. One is to explain to us uh, the relationship between uh, the movement and the Palestinians, vice versa. And have there been any expressions of solidarity between the two movements or not? And if so, where, if there have been expressions of solidarity, where can we see them? That's number one. And number two 
if you could also speak a little louder. I have no problems listening to you all the way across the other side of the Atlantic, but some of our friends in Europe are having a little bit of a tr problem hearing you. So if you can also speak a little louder and then okay. three or four minutes would be very, very good. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, for the relations with the Palestinians, as you know, I mean, when uh, the first groups from the North Kurdistan, they went to Lebanon, they were in good relations with the Palestinians. Uh, and still they have some relations. And uh, of course, we would like to have them. Uh, but the Palestinians, uh, they got away from the Kurdish people and from our movements. It's just because uh, they are just, uh, I mean, the national nationalism, I mean, a radical nationalism with them, the Arabic nationality, and uh, just leading them to get far away. They are afraid uh, to deal with us. Uh, even, I mean, we have Palestinians in Syria. We are trying to contact them, but they are afraid to have any connection with us. Otherwise, for their problem, I mean, with uh, uh, Israel, uh, we think, I mean, what we are doing here uh, the democratic nation uh, state or democratic nation solution that could be a solution for them also in Palestine to leave two nations in one state or together with the Jewish people. I think it's a solution for them also. They can get uh, a benefit from our practice. I mean, how we can live with the Arabs, with the Syriacs in our lands. Maybe they can do the same. So I think our experiment it could be helpful for them too. Uh, but just as I said, because uh, those extreme nationalism, Arabic, uh, Arab nationalism, is not getting them far away from us now. Uh, because as the boss says, we are separatists. We are going to divide Syria as rumors, of course. We are not accepting such uh, claims, but uh, what the Arabs thinking, I mean, even the Syrian opposition, they are thinking the same. So we are uh, trying to have our relations with them, good relations. So, yes. Thank you very much. Any last words? Uh, well, uh, what can I say? I think, uh, I think uh, nobody should be afraid of the uh, Kurdish people revolution because it's a democracy, it's the women's rights, uh, the equality between the women and the men and uh, even the people can live together and uh, instead of uh, I mean uh, getting against it you should understand what's going on in northeast of Syria and is a practical way for the uh, democratic nation I think uh, to live together and uh, that's all I can say now thank you very much thank you thank you for a very very good introduction Jeffrey your turn. Yeah, thank you. Um, so it's the great honor to get the chance uh, to speak alongside uh, alongside these distinguished uh, uh, activists and organic intellectuals all associated with the Kurdish freedom movement, especially on this most emblematic day, the 15th of August, which marks the 36th anniversary of the PKK's campaign and struggle for freedom. Now, as has come up already, uh, the PKK is considered a terrorist organization uh, by the United States uh, uh, and the EU, among others. And I think uh, this actually very much uh, makes it very difficult for, uh, the, for the organization and the Kurdish freedom movement more generally to garner uh, support. Uh, a, a significant level of support. There is, however, uh, a recent decision from January of 2020 uh, in Brussels, the Court of Appeal uh, found that the PKK is not a terrorist organization, but a party in a non-international armed conflict. Uh, opposing the Kurds of the Turkish state. And I want to uh, spend my time here to give some context about why this is a, uh, when understood, the, the, when the struggle is understood in context, this is a very important decision. So uh, human rights atrocities and, and state terror have been and continue to be inflicted upon the Kurdish minority by Turkish security forces, most brutally in the early 90s, and now again with increasing intensity since the breakdown of peace negotiations in July of 2015. All out war against the Kurdish freedom movement, both inside Turkey and across the border in Syria, has been the centerpiece of President Erdogan's alliance with the far right. 
Now more than ever, perhaps, the struggle for democracy in Turkey is thus intimately intertwined with the urgent need for a peaceful resolution to the so-called Kurdish question. The historical trajectory of the Kurdish freedom movement has been profoundly influenced by the context of militarism, authoritarianism, and paramilitary violence in which and against which it initially emerged and has never ceased to be in conflict. The Republic of Turkey, we must remember, was on the front lines of the Cold War, a NATO member, as, as has been mentioned, and its security apparatus is armed to the teeth and was consistently permitted, encouraged to be ruthless in its efforts to eradicate threats to capitalist social property relations. Torture and extrajudicial killings of leftists and pro-Kurdish militants propelled a process of polarization and radicalization that took place from the late 60s, which escalated after successive coups in 1971 and 1980, coups that were attended to crush the left and that reduced the legal channels for mobilizing anti-capitalist opposition to a bare minimum. The Kurdistan Workers' Party, or PKK, launched its military offensive against the Turkish state on this day in 1984, four years after the 1980 coup had triggered a bout of severe state repression, two years after the 1982 constitutional reform had further entrenched military prerogatives, effectively confining and constricting the terrain of civilian politics. In a word, the PKK's offensive was a product and response to this context of state aggression and denial of basic civil liberties. At its inception, the PKK was structured in accordance with the Marxist-Leninist principle of democratic centralism and conceived simultaneously as a vanguard political party and as a paramilitary force, a guerrilla committed to waging a prolonged people's war for national liberation. Its goal was originally the attainment of a, a Kurdish nation state, indeed a state communist utopia which would unite Kurds from Turkey, Iraq, Iran, and Syria in a greater Kurdistan. A utopian dream, no doubt, equal to, if not even exceeding in ambition, the dystopian project against which it was struggling, that of the Kemalist Republic, with its intransigent goal of assimilating, if need be annihilating, all traces of Kurdish identity into a homogenized Turkish national imaginary. The PKK as a paramilitary guerrilla force has from the time of its inception been considered by the state authorities of the Republic of Turkey to be a terrorist organization. Indeed, Turkish authorities have consistently treated the PKK as public enemy number one. And as a result, those suspected of belonging to the organization or even sympathizing with it have been the victims of successive waves of brutal state terror. At the height of the war between the Turkish state and the PKK in the early 90s, thousands of Kurdish villages were forcefully evacuated, tens of thousands murdered, a mass exodus provoked. More recently, since the breakdown of peace negotiations in 2015, Another brutal wave of state terror has been unleashed, this time including urban settings, leaving another bloody trail of thousands killed and hundreds of thousands forcibly displaced. The devastation and trauma wrought upon the Kurdish people by the Turkish security forces, the systematic state terror, the total evacuation of thousands of villages, the killing of, of tens of thousands, the displacement and exile of millions, made it abundantly clear to the PKK's undisputed leader, Abdullah Ocalan, by the early 90s, that the Maoist come Guevarista strategy of a prolonged people's war by the PKK could not lead to military victory, to national liberation, to the creation of an independent socialist Kurdish nation state. The military might of NATO's second biggest army exercised within its own sovereign territory was simply too brutal, too overwhelming a force to overcome. Faced with the realization of the impossibility of victory, even the prospect of total annihilation, Ojalan began to reach out to European politicians from his refuge in the Beka Valley and in Damascus in search of a way to end the war without sacrificing the dignity of the Kurdish people, in search of a way towards a peaceful and democratic resolution to the raging conflict. The end of the Cold War undoubtedly also influenced Ojalan's burgeoning conviction that the party and the movement which he had brought into being was in dire need of reformation, indeed of fundamental reorientation. The collapse of the Soviet Union meant the disappearance of a state communist bloc capable of patronizing and protecting a liberated single party socialist Kurdish Republic inevitably waged between hostile, wedged between hostile neighboring nation states. It simultaneously signified the definitive death knell for the credibility of the state communist ideal. In some, it induced a crisis both at the level of realpolitik and at the level of principles. There were also developments originating from the grassroots in Bakur which were amplified, encouraged, and promoted by the organized diaspora in Europe, operating within the orbit of the movement. 
These, develops, these developments included the spread of public celebrations and mass protests, most emblematically around the annual Nehru's festival, reconstrued as a myth of Kurdish resistance, as well as, 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 as an event organized to commemorate the self-immolation of PKK prisoners and other heroic acts of sacrifice among PKK martyrs. Indeed, a whole repertoire of representation of resistance practices emerged, congealing around the myth of Nehru's and all, also hoisting up a host of exemplars, a veritable pantheon of revolutionary martyrs, the public commemoration, even worship of whom burst onto the streets in a wave of, of rebellions. From the early 19, 1990s, such burgeoning civil resistance against the security forces came increasingly to complement the ongoing guerrilla campaign. One of the more remarkable aspects of the repertoire of representation of Kurdish resistance that emerged from the early 90s onwards was the prominent place of women. Not only did women participate in large numbers in numerous rebellions, they also took, on a, and took an active role in the activities of the legal political Kurdish parties. Indeed, they came to the forefront of the resistance and were increasingly constituted and commemorated as exemplars. Alongside and helping to propel such emergent symbolic and organizational prominence of women in the movement over the course of the 90s, Ojalan would formulate an elaborate theoretical critique of patriarchy. Indeed, he would come to consider women as the first colony and even to redefine national liberation as first and foremost, the liberation of women. Ojalan's emphasis on the primacy of the struggle against patriarchy was quite developed even before his abduction and imprisonment and is featured prominently in his copious prison writings perhaps especially in his original synthesis and articulation of the long history of hierarchy, his vision of the dialectic of domination and resistance. In Ojalan's account of patriarchy, its origins are intimately intertwined with the emergence of the state. And especially since his imprisonment, Ojalan's thought has taken a radically anti-statist turn. What began as a pragmatic, realistic appraisal of the impossibility of attaining a Kurdish nation state through a guerrilla war against Turkish security forces, and as a compromise proposal calling for, re, for, for respect for human rights and cultural rights alongside measures of decentralization or autonomy developed under the influence perhaps especially of Murray Bookchin into a principled rejection of the state. In effect, Ojalan advanced a redefinition of self-determination now understood as radical direct democracy against the state. Under, under Bookchin's influence, Ojalan would also take up the theme of the urgent need for social ecology even so, as with the emphasis on the struggle against patriarchy, the sensitivity of the movement to ecological issues was not just born like Athena. It did not just spring spontaneously out of Ojalan's head. Instead, it was forged in concrete struggles, most emblematically the struggle to save the ancient village of Hasankia uh, in the province of Batman, set to be submerged underwater by the Turkish state's Ilisu Dam project a struggle in which the European environmentalist movement would forge organic links with the Kurdish movement, thereby prefiguring the overlapping decentralized networks of resistance envisioned by the democratic and federal ideal. Ojalan's articulation of democratic confederalism grows out of a deep disenchantment with and critique of Marxism-Leninism, which in quasi-confessional terms in a series of penetrating self-criticisms of his own previous mentality, he accuses of reproducing the cult of hierarchy, of behaving as organizations like mini states, acting in accordance with the logic of conquest and domination rather than resistance and freedom. The emphasis on the struggle against patriarchy, the fostering of awareness of the urgency of social ecology, the thoroughgoing critique of the state, the promotion of popular assemblies and championing of radical, radically decentralized direct democracy, all of these components of the paradigm shift are explicitly contrasted to the democratic centralist model and mindset. Likewise, Ojalan's critique of Marxism-Leninism includes a critique of its scientism, of its hostility to the realm of myth, of its bias in favor of secular fundamentalism. In this latter vein, in recent years, Ojalan has urged the Kurdish movement to organize a democratic Islam Congress with the purpose of elaborating a liberationist interpretation of the ethical and political implications of professing and practicing authentic Islamic faith. Whether in practice, the tradition and perception of militant secularism among the movement cadres and supporters has been transformed is another matter certainly worthy of close empirical investigation, given not only the history of conflict with Kurdish Hezbollah, uh, but also in terms of countering the appeal of Erdogan's AKP and its brand of, brand of patriarchal neoliberal Islam, not to mention the struggle against reactionary jihadists in Rojava. The fact that the first Kurdish rebellions against the Kemalist Republic were mobilized along the secular religious divide in the name of the community of believers is not irrelevant in the present. 
Indeed, the proper relation between religion and politics continues to be a source of dispute and contestation capable of dividing contemporary Kurds. The movement's attempt to articulate a democratic Islam is intended to transcend such divisions. How serious and successful this attempt is uh, will no doubt condition the contours and horizons of support for the ambitious democratic and federal project advanced by the Kurdish freedom movement. Jeffrey, Finally, Jeffrey, yeah. you have two yeah. minutes. You have two minutes. Perfect, perfect. Uh, I'll, I'll need less. Finally and okay. crucially, the principled rejection of the strategy of national liberation, understood in terms of the pursuit of a Kurdish nation state, has included a rather elaborate set of arguments against the insidious evils of what Ojalan refers to as feudal nationalism, most often in reference to the example, example of Barzani in South Kurdistan. The ideological and programmatic reorientation of the Kurdish freedom movement thus includes not just a renunciation of the goal of the state, but more ambitiously, the aspiration to transcend altogether the confines of the nationalist imaginary. A transcendence which, would not, which should not be confused with repudiating pride and Kurdishness, but rather with escaping the dialectic of majority versus minority. Indeed, as Ojalan has insisted, in democratic confederalism, there is no room for any kind of hegemony striving. That's a quote. Self-administration and autonomous organization of direct democratic assemblies, not to mention a, 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 of self-defense militias for all ethnic and religious groups as the alternative to the tyranny of the majority, to the hegemonic striving of deeply ingrained, uh, deeply ingrained in the ideology of nationalism. A tall order to ask from a movement that has sacrificed so many lives for the dream of a greater Kurdistan. An exercise of democratic leadership, if ever there was, on the part of Ojalan. His attempt to get his followers to dream internationalist dreams of radical democracy, to imagine forms of confederation that cut across and beyond the mental borders imposed by the cult of national community, easier to pronounce than to achieve. The struggle against patriarchy, the struggle for social ecology, the struggle against the nation state, the struggle against sectarianism in all its forms, the struggle for radical direct democracy, these are all significant departures from the original articulation of the struggle for national liberation, understood as the creation of a state communist greater Kurdistan. Indeed, ambitious aspirations and a thoroughgoing reorientation of the goals of the movement, which have taken on a life of their own with the revolutionary developments in Rojava. Thank you. Thank you for an excellent presentation. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. Mm. Rock welcome. and your turn. Rhymer. Can I? Can you hear me now? Yep. Great. Okay. Sorry, that was my mistake. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for inviting me uh, to this panel. I'm glad to have the opportunity to speak here uh, alongside all of you. Um, I, I would like to, since my position in the international initiative uh, Freedom for Abdullah Erdogan Peace in Kurdistan. I would like to emphasize a little bit Öcalan's role in this because it's something that seems to be uh, overlooked a little. Uh, him being now in prison for more than 20 years and uh, his role in the 1984 uprising, um, something that I think needs to be highlighted a little. Um, everybody and also um, Meral and uh, Salih emphasized it a bit. Uh, 15th of August of 1984 is, is much of a turning point for the Kurdish uh, people. Um, and this is so because it seems so unlikely and so impossible. Um, after the military coup of 1980 in Turkey, um, everything was banned. The whole left was in shatters, uh, but also the political right. Uh, all kinds of political parties were banned and nobody thought it was possible to organize an, an armed resistance uh, and if at all then maybe in the cities but certainly not in, in Kurdistan and uh, Öcalan tried to convince people uh, that it is possible he gave them an inspiration he gave them a, a belief and he organized for that it didn't happen you know out of the blue skies but he had a, a plan a strategy and, and organized for that and uh, when the um, armed resistance of the 15th of August 84 happened, uh, people still didn't believe it. You know, it, it's, the, the government said, you know, this is something that will be crushed in a week or something or in a month. Um, but looking back, this is only the first in a long string of things that seemed uh, very, very unlikely or impossible uh, that Öcalan believed in 
and made other people believe in. Like Meryl uh, emphasized the role of the of the women's movement. I mean, who would have thought that there would be the strongest uh, women's movement of the Middle East or maybe right now of the world uh, would would come from Kurdistan? But Erdogan believed in that. He believed that would be that it would be possible and uh, supported this and and opened the doors for that and and supported it and uh, that helped make make it possible. Who would have believed? Uh, after the rebellion in, in a lot of uh, Arab and North, Af North African countries in 2011, uh, that all of these rebellion would a couple of years later be over and nothing or very little come out of it in a lot of countries, but that a, a revolution would take in, in a part of Syria in Rojava um, and would change the, the face of the Middle East there. So there's a lot of uh, um, these seeming impossible things that Erdogan foresaw a long time, long time ago, uh, and, and organized for it in the long term and motivated people and organized them to, to really make it happen. And the other thing, um, also Salih Muslim emphasized this, he reached out uh, very early after the beginning of the armed struggle, not only to politicians in Europe, but also to uh, the, the Turkish, to the head of state, the prime ministers, to the presidents, uh, to say, look, this is something we need to resolve together. We need to resolve this, the conflict that is at the root of, of what is happening between um, the Kurds and the Turkish state. Uh, so let's sit on the table. Let's, let's uh, find a political and a peaceful resolution to this conflict. And he has since then taken every opportunity uh, to urge for such a solution. A large part of his uh, prison writings, the, the books he, he penned in, in prison, is dedicated to that. And every opportunity that he had since 1999 to speak publicly um, or to make some kind of call uh, goes into that direction, to find uh, a peaceful resolution um, to this conflict. And I think this is one of the other things that seem maybe very unlikely right now. There were times when it seemed a bit more likely. Um, but it's something where he's still able to make uh, many, many people uh, believe in that and, and strive for that cause uh, because it's a, a very uh, necessary thing for and the next step for the development in, in the Middle East, uh, really uh, to make Kurdistan the, the center point of a, um, a wave, wave of peaceful uh, political solutions of, of a lot of conflicts around it. So um, this is why we are trying to promote uh, a, a campaign to, to promote Erdogan's freedom as a very essential center point um, for, for a peace process in the Middle East and, espe and especially between Turkey and, and the Kurds, uh, the Kurdish movement. Um, but also um, he is the, the political head of a large population, millions of people are demanding his freedom. There has been a signature campaign a couple of years ago, which collected 10, millions of, 10 million signatures uh, for his freedom, which is probably unique in the history of uh, campaigns for political prisoners. So this is not, not a small thing. It's not a, a side issue, but it's very uh, central um, in in the struggle, Erdogan is the architect of the armed struggle, yes, but he's also the architect of the peace process and he deserves to be free and uh, his role in all this should be recognized much more than it is right now. That's uh, wonderful, Reimer. Thank you very, very much. Now, we had asked you uh, before we had this broadcast to mention some of the important books of Ocalans that have already been published in English or in any other languages. Could you direct <laughs> us to some of this? Yeah, well, I think English is, is the most uh, suitable. Actually, a lot of his uh, prison writings between 99 and 2011 have already been, been published. Yeah. Um, the, his main work is the, the five volume manifesto uh, of, a demo of the democratic civilization. Uh, two volumes of this are available from um, from New Compass uh, called uh, Civilization and Capitalism. And very recently this year, the third and 
really the heart, the centerpiece of the four, five volume thing um, uh, was published in the US um, at PM Press. It's called The Sociology of Freedom. Um, other important works, actually the, the historical foundation of, of his whole uh, democratic civilization thesis is, uh, was published under the name Prison Writings in two volumes um, called The Roots of Civilization and uh, the PKK and the Kurdish Question in the 21st Century uh, in London with Pluto Press. Very good. Now, of course, what there's also, if I may add that, there's a lot of, uh, there's a couple of short brochures that we have uh, yeah. Yeah. compiled together from his prison writings on certain topic as a, as a short introduction in his ideas, and they've been they're available for free on our website, and they are very popular worldwide in a lot of languages available. So in the in the YouTube that is going to be posted following this uh, webinar we'll make sure that all of these sources are going to be um, are going to be uh, addressed and full information as to where people can get additional information so this applies to all the panelists if you have any suggestions as to what should be read in addition to what we already know that would be very very good now, uh, slowly we're starting to get um, some questions. Mm, okay. um, do you see the second question? Does somebody want to take a, a crack at that? Could one of you talk more about the Democratic Islam Congress with its liberationist interpretation that is being urged by Ocalan as an alternative to secular fundamentalism? Anybody wants to jump into that? Please. I can. Go ahead. Okay. Um, Erdogan has written a lot on religion, and not only on Islam, but on uh, all the monotheistic religions, but also uh, older forms of religion, like from the uh, from Sumerian times, from 5,000 years ago. And his um, his interpretation is that all of these religions have kind of a double character that they serve as um, liberationist movements, that they serve as social movements. Um, that often have an oppositional character, criticizing, calling for justice, criticizing the, the people in power, but that they, uh, in time, very often get um, adopted by the people in power and then serve as, a, for instance, as a state religion and as a religion of uh, the, the people in power. So specifically on Islam, which he knows best of all the, the religious systems, he has explained uh, how this historically developed, which um, parts of historical Islam were progressive, which served uh, progressive goals and, and uh, for, the, for the communities, and how uh, Islam was very early on converted into a tool of state building, of ruling, of conquering, and thus lost lo much of its uh, progressive character. Um, so by focusing and emphasizing the progressive traditions in Islam, consisting of some of the original uh, moves of, of Islam, but also on oppositional um, traditions inside of Islam, which there are a lot that in the West are often not, not very well known. He suggested that the mosques should be used as they were before, as spaces for open discussion about all kinds of political issues, or issues of the community, and thus be used in a progressive way. And this was a suggestion taken up by uh, Muslim scholars and, and uh, people from the communities and uh, um, try to, uh, well, maybe other people can say more about the outcome of this, but that was the, this initiative, which was very uh, interesting and very well received at the time. Good. That's a, that's a good beginning. Now, I would like to ask another question to all of you. Um, and 
whoever wants to answer it is welcome to do so. Ojalan, we all agree, is a seminal thinker in all of this and a seminal activist. But in the Kurdish freedom movement, are there other individuals, other theorists, other activists, women, as well as men, who uh, should draw our attention, uh, should we become aware of, both as theorists in what they have written or what they have spoken, or as activists in the movement? Can we name some other individuals and just not focus everything as seems to be on our dear Apo? Miral, question for you. Sorry, I was just reading the other question for me, so because of this. Um, you know, I think maybe sometimes it's not enough reflected how um, the process of, let's say, uh, producing thoughts uh, is happening inside the movement. And uh, maybe that's, that's the problem because, for example, um, uh, within the women's movement, there's a lot of theoretical production happening daily, on a daily basis. And most of it is collectivized. So because of this, you have, for example, a lot of uh, journals where this, this production is reflected and also books. But um, I think it's, it's difficult to give uh, names uh, because it's a very huge, I mean, you have a lot of intellectuals in Kurdistan, you have a lot of politicians, you have a lot of representatives of the different parts of the movement itself. Uh, you have artists, you have writers, I mean, like in every society. And um, maybe um, outside, this is not very well reflected. Uh, because of this, I, I, I'm not, I don't know, giving names is for me, but, but um, yes, it's not so that uh, it's just uh, Apple and nothing else. Uh, and you should not forget that um, there is more or less no contact to, to the outside world. And uh, because of this, we are not receiving any new writings from him uh, since a couple of years. But um, I mean, it's 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 okay to uh, to get proposals, to get ideas from him, and to to develop these ideas further, to uh, conceptualize them, to theorize them, uh, and to develop other ideas and theories, which is happening in a very vital way also in Kurdistan and in all parts of Kurdistan, I would say. Thank you, Jeffrey. You wanted to add something. Yeah, just in terms of uh, people wanting to know about uh, prominent women in the movement, uh, there's a great book uh, that came out for, with PM Press in English, I think a couple of years ago, translated by Janet Beale, uh, uh, called Sarah, My Whole Life Was a Struggle, about the life of Sakina Genghis. It's a, her own memoir. Uh, she was uh, one of the leaders of the movement who was murdered brutally in uh, Paris in, in 2013. Uh, so I think for people interested, uh, she tells the, her story. She was one of the founders of the PKK, uh, very much at, at, at the center of uh, the move, uh, uh, the, 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 the women's, uh, the initiative for the women's uh, protagonism in the movement. Um, so uh, even though what, what Meryl says is very true, that so much of what happens is communal thinking, there, is, there are prominent figures that, uh, that people can uh, look into uh, uh, their biographies. And I think Sarah Sakina is, is definitely one of them. Uh, also, with respect to uh, your question about books on Ojalon, there's, a, there's another very interesting book uh, uh, that came out just last year or maybe earlier this year, uh, which is uh, called Building Free Life, a Dialogue with Ojalon. And that's also, uh, uh, I believe, PM Press. Um, and that uh, it, uh, features people like David Graeber, Antonio Negri, Emmanuel Wallerstein, Rada D'Souza, John Holloway, uh, a, a variety of different very uh, prominent intellectuals kind of engaging with uh, Ojalan's ideas. So you see there's a kind of dialogue between the movement and Ojalan. There's also a dialogue on the broader left 
uh, and then particularly in the Western left with, o uh, uh, with Ogilon's ideas that, are, that is uh, a very fertile terrain, I think worth uh, taking a look at. Thank you. Uh, now, probably uh, all of you or most of you have read the recent article uh, by Ojalan that was published in, um, in Jacobin, which is a very wide circulation uh, periodical uh, in English. Um, uh, and the question that we have been asked is how up to date is that expression of, of opinion and analysis by, by Ojalan? Yeah, that text um, was edited together from from different sources. Um, some of it actually from the books, which is uh, indeed uh, like ten years old. Uh, however, the, the the call for um, again taking up uh, peace talks and the the readiness uh, for this and the um, the statement that given the opportunity or, or provided the, the conditions for that, it would be very quickly possible uh, to resolve the conflict. That was taken from statements from Erdogan, um from last year that he made uh, through people who were able to visit after the hunger strikes um, against his, his isolation. So it was taken from from very recent messages that the politically important and current uh, parts of that. Well, I think the, I mean, the, 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 the fact that uh, he's like not only not able to communicate with the outside world, but also not to be visited by anybody, like this total incommunicado is uh, scandalized much too little. It's, it's almost as if this is something normal. I, you know, yeah, it just happens that people get used to it. It's, it's a huge scandal in terms of, uh, of human rights of the Council of Europe. Europe is directly uh, responsible for these, these conditions also in Turkey. Um, so this should be, this, I, I found it a bit little, too little uh, dealt with and debated when discussing about the Jacobin article. Thank you. Now, uh, a question for Meral. Uh, in northeastern Syria, how have non-Kurdish women responded to the positive example of the YPG? Uh, so maybe uh, some of you remember uh, pictures of places like Minbich, and I think Minbich was celebrating today its uh, uh, the, uh, the fourth anniversary of its uh, liberation from ISIS. Uh, maybe you remember the pictures when women were throwing their black um, uh, clothes down and embracing the YPJ uh, 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 fighters uh, that came to their village uh, to uh, liberate them. So this is one issue. And the other one is that even today, they, there are a lot of non-Kurdish women in the ranks of the YPJ and also within uh, the Syrian Democratic Forces. So it's uh, today not uh, uh, just uh, uh, an all uh, Kurdish uh, female force anymore, uh, YPJ or YPJ. Uh, so it's not just about Arab women also, uh, for example, Armenian women are joining uh, them or establishing their own self-defense forces, Arab women, uh, Turkmenic women, etc. So it's not just a, a Kurdish, um, uh, women's uh, defense force anymore. I just wanted to add one short sentence about the issue between Kurds and Palestinians, because I think it's important to, to uh, know. I think we should problematize also the relationship between uh, Palestinian forces, and I'm not just talking about Hamas, but also Fatah movement and the AKP government, because within the last years, we can see that there is a growing uh, develop, uh, um, relationship between both. And uh, I think that this is an issue that should be um, openly uh, discussed also, because I don't think that there is a changing attitude of the Kurdish freedom movement towards uh, the um, Palestinian people, because um, we started, I mean, the, the armed struggle also started in, um, uh, let's say, solidarity 
uh, between both people. Uh, and today it's important, I think, to, to create a kind of revival also of this uh, brother and uh, brother uh, sisterhood uh, between the Palestinians and the Kurds. But I think that's, that's an important issue which is hindering uh, this, um, let's say, uh, solidarity between the two people today. Very good. Thank you for that additional information. Uh, there is a question for Saleh. Can you tell us more about your experience in government? In what ways do the theories of democratic and federalism come into practice in an ordinary day at work? Well, uh, hi again to everybody, yes. Uh, now for the governments, of course, uh, we are as a PYD, we are a political party. Uh, we have our friends maybe in the government, but uh, myself, I am not a part of it, but I know how it's going on. Uh, the most important thing is everything, I mean, even the uh, decisions and ideas and so is going uh, collectivism is the main thing here. I mean, if you do it, I mean, maybe uh, we are talking about the collectivism and we are talking also about radical democracy. If you have problem in somewhere, I mean, many times, uh, maybe in Kamishto, in Kobani, in some other places, if we have a problem, we just call the people, I mean, which they are involved in this subject or that, that matter and let them to decide in the right way. And we just obey them. It was the same maybe for fuel, for the uh, grain and for the others. I mean, we, we just leave the decision for them to do it. So the collectivism and the radical democracy is the most important things for the governing because you, feel, you, you let the people to feel that they are uh, the decision makers. And uh, this is the most important thing in our uh, I mean, uh, for the administration in this area. So this is the way to do it, I mean. And of course, we have uh, our institutions and we have our organizations in everywhere. And just one point, I mean, uh, what I'm going to say about the uh, 15th of August, I mean, it's not just a revolution just for, for the army to fight against the enemies. I mean, it affected the society and just to let the society to organize themselves in everywhere. So it was the real revolution for the society, for even for the, uh, maybe for the economy, for the women, for the children. So we, we can find a lot of institutions here and uh, they are democratically, they organize themselves and they can decide. So this is the result of this revolution also. So this is what can I say about the, the government. Um, another, thank you, another uh, important question that has been asked is how influential are the ideas of democratic and federalism in other parts of Kurdistan, outside of Rojava? Are these ideas practiced in any meaningful way in any other country in the Middle East uh, or the world for that matter, but in the Middle East? Is there any echo of these ideas in other countries? where Kurds are or where other people are, to your knowledge? Uh, well, uh, this is the first example. I mean, it's the first experiment in the Middle East because we used to have dictatorship, despotic regimes, uh, and depressing the regimes, I mean, all the people. So it's the first example and the first experiment in the, in the region. And even now, uh, for the Arab tribes, for example, we are, I mean, we had a lot of efforts just to persuade them and this is the democracy and we should live together. So uh, the most difficult things, I mean, in the Middle East to change the mentality and everywhere because uh, maybe they still believe in the nation state and believe in the old and uh, they, show, they should uh, get support from uh, some powers to establish and maybe to manage their countries. Uh, which everything is rejected, I mean, by us. The people should depend on themselves. They should be able to, de or to defend themselves. They should depend, I mean, everything uh, by the people. The decisions should be made by them. So this is, first of all, it needs mentality changing. 
until now, as a PYD with political party, we are making every day maybe tens of lectures, ten of meetings, for uh, for just to to teach the people, to tell the people that the democracy and the uh, equality between the people and the, the peace for everybody and then a, the I mean the benefit of the uh, democratic nation and we are trying to explain to them. So now all the tribes uh, with us believed that we are right and even some other parts of uh, Syria just like Idlib, like Dara and so and even Durzis from Sueda, they came to us, they, they want to get uh, benefit from our experiment and we are trying to help them. I think it will be easier if we have a model on the ground and everybody can see what is the result. But of course, I mean, uh, we are suffering from these attacks from everybody from Turkey. They're not just trying not to give us uh, the opportunity to contact the others. Uh, from the other side, even the regime, I mean, they are just uh, banning us from uh, talking to the other Syrians. So this is the problem. Uh, and uh, of course, it's a struggle. We should do it, I mean. But we believe uh, what we are doing is the right, and it should be, I, I said, I mean, uh, freedom is uh, contagious and uh, should go to everywhere. Everybody sh should know what's going on, and they should be trying to do the same. Well, we, it, know, that, yeah, we yeah. know that some of these ideas are being discussed and practiced by the Kurdish community within Turkey. But what about in northern Iraq? Are any of these ideas getting on the ground, right. being discussed in northern Iraq, for example? Yes, I think so, because there is some movements and some demonstrations and the people calling, I mean, for the world, for the democracy. But maybe it's a, it's a little bit they have problems, I think, especially with the other parties, which is, uh, uh, I mean... Uh, trying to coordinate with the Turkish state. So it's a little bit, uh, maybe a little bit difficult now. But we have, I mean, we have seeds and uh, the people are trying to do something. Well, that's a question that has been, that has been asked just now. Can we have a report on how the Syrian Kurds are doing since the most recent invasions? the most military attacks. In other words, how are people defending themselves and how hopeful can one be that uh, in spite of these military incursions, uh, this important experiment will survive? I mean, that, this, is a, this, is a, this is a very important question for all of us. Uh, well, what I, I can say, I mean, uh, the Turkish invasion, especially in and often in Sirikani and Tel Aviv, uh, they have just done it by drones and the Air Force. And uh, they cannot invade, I mean, on the ground. I mean, maybe they have some of those mercenaries sent in. I mean, they are uh, trying to, to defend them and trying to keep them, encourage them for killing the people and so. But they cannot do it without any, uh, any uh, the, I mean, space uh, protection. So our problem is with those uh, and drones and this, uh, I mean, if we have just uh, uh, air defense system, it wouldn't be so difficult for us to protect ourselves against the uh, Turkish invasion. The problem really, uh, and now maybe if we have, uh, uh, I mean, uh, non-fly non zone and so, uh, that's okay, we can do everything. I mean, we are uh, not... A, I mean, on the ground for the military, they cannot advance. And even for these mercenaries, they cannot, I mean, they cannot stand against the Kurdish people, especially we have the Kurdish people very well organized. I mean, even the people are, are on the villages, in the cities, uh, other than uh, the, the democratic Syrian forces. So all the people, they are able to defend themselves. But the only problem, I mean, is these uh, drones, which that uh, every they are hitting everywhere. I mean, maybe you have 
some examples in Kobani when they hit three women, and also maybe in some other places. So this is the difficulty we are facing now. And we hope, I mean, if the, I mean, those space should, should be free for Turkey to do it, especially, I mean, the United States and the International Alliance, they should keep them out. If they do that, it, it, would, it wouldn't be any problem for us. But of course, I mean, our people, they, they will resist, I mean, maybe those invasions, it happens just because those airstrikes and drones and so maybe uh, you remember in Afrin and the same for Tel Aviv and uh, the, the first of all there was about uh, 73 planes on the on the space of Afrin I mean the first attack and they have done the same in, in, in Tel Aviv and the same for Seri Kani so the Air Force I mean if we have uh, this air defense system it wouldn't be a problem for us, I think. Well, uh, maybe we could raise some money to get some air, <laughs> air defense. Well, it's not a problem with the money. It's the problem, I mean, the air defense system it should be supplied to the country, to the states. This is the international law. Otherwise, yes. There, yes. there will be no problem. I mean, some states should support us, should give it to us, or no fly zone is the important thing. They the can do it, I mean, by decision. Yeah. But Jeffrey will testify that uh, persuading the allies of Turkey to actually uh, discipline Turkey or have them uh, not be as militarily aggressive as they are uh, is uh, that much of a possibility. Well, I think Turkey is dangerous not only for the Kurdish people. Yes. It's for everybody, really, actually. And uh, the evidences are on the ground. Everybody can see what's happening in Libya, what's happening in the East uh, Mediterranean, and even in between Armenia and Azerbaijan. So I think it's dangerous for everybody. Now, under these, um, under these circumstances that, that uh, the ex this great experiment is is being harassed militarily by, um, by these military forces, including the Turkish forces. How can you describe to us, any one of you, how is the ecological experiment within that territory developing? I mean, is it really a possible to do radical ecological advances within that territory or is this just uh, you know we plant uh, flowers and plant trees and that's about as far as we can go I mean try to explain to us a little bit what kind of ecological programs are being put in place in that area shall I maybe continue please please I think it's it's very difficult to to develop um, or to practice um, ecological this ecological paradigm also under these circumstances, especially uh, in a situation of war, because um, you know you have continuing um, air attacks. They are burning our mountains. Um, a lot of fields are, are burning. You know, uh, animals are killed. Uh, another issue is also about the situation in the Middle East, in the whole Middle East, not just in Kurdistan or in one part of Kurdistan, because I think there is a deep connection between ecology and economy. And if you don't have sustainable economy, it's very difficult to uh, develop or to practice um, an ecological uh, uh, lifestyle. For example, the issue about dams in Kurdistan is a very serious issue. Or, for example, you have oil, but you have maybe not... Um, the 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 uh, let's say the um the the structures you need for an ecological way of taking this oil out you know for example uh so oil issues water issues um then uh, that you have a lot of soil just drying uh the attacks by the turkish state especially makes it very very uh, complicated and difficult so you have for example and project that's called Make Rojava Green Again, 
or what's happening just with the beginning of the revolution is to return to let's say kind of agricultural society because under the Ba'ath regime it was impossible it was you know in a systematic way uh, uh, people were um, banned or rejected from from planting from from agriculture and other things just not to be able to stand on their feet you know so I think that's a general issue that you can't disconnect from uh, the situation of war and the attitude of the state forces also in that place. Another just short adding to the first question about democratic confederalism in the region, because I would add that here in northern uh, in in southern Kurdistan or northern Iraq, there's the example of Mahmoud, which is a refugee uh, camp which is under attack now, uh, under embargo since more than 13 months which is uh, self-ruled by the people based on the principles of democratic confederalism. And I would say that also what I can also see with my own eyes or what I can follow here now is that in a lot of countries of the Middle East, the interest towards democratic confederalism and especially the concept of democratic nation is increasing a lot just based uh, on the problems and the conflicts the people are realizing. For example, in places like Lebanon, where you have a lot of sectarian uh, uh, and ethnic uh, conflicts, uh, people are looking, especially a new generation of people uh, organizing themselves, are looking for a model or a solution that might fit to their problems. And a lot of people in places of the Middle East where you have just um, this, this failed uh, nation state models that are just constantly re reproducing a crisis and conflict and war, etc. people are looking for a new model. And I, I can see that more and more people uh, embrace the ideas of Abdullah Öcalan as a kind of model just and not just for the solution of the Kurdish question, but also for the problems of the Middle East in general and of their country or community uh, in particular also. Very, very interesting. Very, very interesting. Thank you very, very much for that. Now, we only have uh, a few more minutes left. So I would like to invite all four of you to make sort of a concluding few sentences and maybe ask each other some questions. So feel free to fill up the time and to dialogue. Uh, and we can then uh, uh, sing together a great song for the Kurdish freedom movement. And we will send it out again to the world as a whole through YouTube in the days ahead. So I invite all of you to just jump in there. Jeffrey. Yeah, so just to follow up on what Meryl was saying with respect to the question of uh, eco the project of ecological sustainability and how that is being implemented or not implemented, the difficulties, I think, are, uh, she ri absolutely rightly points out that it's impossible to really make much of a, 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 of a of progress on this dimension of the project uh, in conditions of war. But I do think that it's really important then again to look at what the democratic and federal model of self-determination means for the region. If the region is at war, the region is at war because of the fact that it sits on so much oil. And so uh, when we look at the geopolitical motives for so much conflict in the region, the only model, which is a model which prov provides an alternative to this ongoing spiral of violence and chaos and more violence and more chaos and more ecological destruction is something like the democratic and federal model, uh, which would mean self-determination for the people, which would also mean self-determination with respect to the question of what comes out of the soil, what doesn't come out of the soil. So I think uh, given the fact that the model of uh, democratic confederalism provides the only viable and desirable alternative to the spiraling of, 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 of tyranny and chaos. I think we need to think about it as a, a precondition for pursuing ecological sustainability. Now, linked to that, I think I, I would also want to make another point with respect to the convergence between this democratic and federal model as articulated by the Kurdish freedom movement and Ojalan and all, and, and all kinds of uh, ideas uh, that are percolating around the globe. Uh, so things are uh, uh, the Zapatista movement, for example, has uh, ha has a relatively uh, 
uh, uh, interesting convergence with the Kurdish movement with respect to its critique of the role of the state. And more generally, if you see, for example, uh, in decolonial theory and the kind of uh, criticisms uh, associated uh, with the, the paradigm of the nation state, even with respect to the indigenous resurgence, stuff like this, you see in many places around the globe, the Black Lives Matter movement, for example, the mo motives of organization, the ways in which they organize, we see a convergence on something like a radical democracy against the state. And so in this respect, I think the Kurdish movement comes to the vanguard of this broader struggle because it's at the center of geopolitical conflict, but it isn't a, 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 a formula or a model which is uh, uh, which is articulated uh, uh, at the back of developments or, or auto entirely autonomously from developments on the broader anti-capitalist left in the 21st century. And so I, I think the way to think about the, the uh, importance of the Kurdish freedom movement is that it's at the vanguard for the struggle for freedom in the world because it's at the epicenter of, of global geopolitical conflict. Thank you, Jeffrey. Yeah. Reimer? Well, I'd also like to add something to, to this ecological thing. Um, I think we should not underestimate the importance of political discussion, political education and organizing. You know, just like maybe 1984, people were thinking, yeah, wh wh why do we need a you know, Kurdish movement right now? You know, we need whatever, socialism or fight against the, uh, the military regime, you know, but the Kurds had been organizing for 10 years and, and started the struggle. You know, maybe in the 90s, people also in Kurdistan thought, yeah, why do we need a women's movement? Where, where did this women's movement come from? We have other problems right now. We have a big, uh, you know, war going on. But the movement insisted on uh, organizing and educating uh, women to form a women's movement. So just right now, yes, maybe there aren't so many practical problems on, on ecology, but the political education and the organizing work that is being done right now has it as a center. So everything that is going to happen and that is happening, if you talk of rebuilding the cities or planning a future economy, the, the ecological thought is central to all this and we should not underestimate this, even if it's just right now in the process mainly of, of discussion and political organizing. Thank you. Anybody else wants to say a few concluding words? Well, uh, that's me. Yes, Sally. Uh, I think if we have a, a free and organized society, uh, we shouldn't uh, be afraid of anything. We can find solutions, we can defend ourselves. There is no difficulties. Maybe we will face some difficulties, but when the people, I mean, make their decisions, they can do everything, even for environment and for the ecology and for the decision. Uh, we are afraid of the, the monopoly which is, can destroy everything in the society. But when the decision is made by the people themselves as a radical democracy for, for everything, and even for the defense system, we are not afraid of, and should, nobody should be afraid of the democracy and for the people, free people to decide. So this is the most important thing we have. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Miral, last words? No, everything has been said. No. <laughs> Wonderful. Listen. No, not, but we don't have so much time to. <laughs> the time is something that unfolds. It's impossible to say everything. So, of course, just... of course, of course. listen, it has been a very important panel. I think the convergence of articulation and uh, interpersonal expressions has been really excellent. I myself, who am an old veteran of panels, can be very proud of the quality of, uh, of this particular panel. And I think we will continue to promote it through, through YouTube. I wanna thank you very, very much, most sincerely. And I want to invite now um, uh, Jason to jump in there. Uh, but I want to answer a question that Reimer directed to me. He said, what should we sing? Well, Reimer, 2000 is the 100th, and precisely December the 10th, which is down the road, is the 100th anniversary of Beethoven. But I can't think of a song <laughs> that he wrote that we can all sing together. So let's postpone that pleasure a little later down, okay? Jason, where are you? I'm right here. Thank you, Dimitri. Thank you to all of our speakers. That was a special event. It was a real pleasure to see it come to life. 
Thank you to our partners, TN Press and Peace in Kurdistan. You can check out the work they're doing in the descriptions below. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can click the subscribe button underneath. This video is part of an ongoing series. So this is one of many engaging discussions that we've hosted on various issues that relate to the publishing work that we do. Uh, also subscribe to our newsletter and follow us on social media. All of those uh, links are also below. If you'd like to donate, you can visit our ebook shop uh, where you can also buy free or discounted books. Um, if you want physical books, go to our website, blackrosebooks.com. And lastly, I'd really like to give a special thank you to Anna, who is my colleague, who's in the background of these calls, who makes these things come to life. She's been working with us since the summer and she's uh, very special and doesn't get nearly enough credit for the hard work she does. So at that, we're gonna go ahead and take this thing offline. So Anna, you can, you can take us offline, but thank you everyone for watching.